So I was thinking about you today, Vinny, because I know you love Robert Greene. You try and tell everyone that he's our favorite <laughs> author. Favorite even though, human being, not just author. Yes, favorite human being ever. And I resonate with a lot of his stuff, but there's some aspect of it that I struggle with. And I think it clicked into place for me today. And it's not just Robert Greene. There's this trope that a lot of people share around people thinking higher of themselves, people thinking that they're better at things than they really are. And I'll caveat, caveat all of this with saying that I might be over here drinking my own Kool-Aid, but I usually do the opposite. My experience and my story has been not believing in myself as much as other people do and not having the confidence that other people tell me I should have in situations. And so when I hear that everyone thinks higher of themselves than is true or in reality, that's where it rubs me the wrong way because that has not been my experience. What are your thoughts on that? Interesting. So you're saying that, so Robert Greene, like the book that I'm reading now and what he's kind of known for is these huge books about big topics. Like the one I'm reading now is the laws of human nature. So each chapter is, takes a broad stroke law of human nature and you're saying that one of the ones that he discusses is people thinking highly of themselves like is it the grandiosity one yeah he talks about that a lot in laws of human nature and then also in 48 laws of power is that everyone has an ego that needs to be put in place mm. and my experience and maybe it's because i'm in my head and that's different than my actions but my experience is most people struggle with self-worth and self-doubt and it's not actually a superiority complex showing up if that makes interesting. sense interesting for sure yeah it's interesting like i don't know if people are i think like what he says is kind of that people are so insecure underneath the surface and we're all we need to have like even the ceos and the bosses are even like the most insecure. So that's like why it benefits to kind of stroke their ego. And maybe the lesser, the things that underneath the surface, like, you know, if it's a Hollywood executive, everybody tells them how good their movies are and everything, but look for the signs of the little things that they're maybe more vulnerable about and more insecure about that nobody really touches on. And if you can kind of, I mean, this is where he gets into the kind of, sly maneuvering and stuff like that the manipulation but manipulation of like if you could subtly kind of stroke their ego in that way where it's not obvious but it's something that they don't show that often or maybe they're you know hollywood hollywood executive but they also on the side they love to write poetry and they're really insecure about it and they don't want to share but you kind of get a sense of that and you oh wow you're actually a great great poet as well. And I think, you know, underneath all of this and what he's saying is that people are really insecure and it doesn't matter how successful or powerful you are, like we're all just human beings at the end of the day. And I think, yeah, it is definitely big brush strokes of painting everybody with the same characteristics, but He's saying that we all are just human beings. And if you understand these kind of basic principles, then you'll have a better time understanding yourself and others. But I get what you're saying that, dude, I, I was just telling you about this where I, <laughs> before this, that I think I made like the dumbest mistake, just like responding in a, in a business uh, text. But, you know, I'm just being hard on myself. And you, you never know what, what truly happened. So <laughs> maybe I'm misunderstanding Robert Greene entirely because I agree with the fact that everyone deep down is insecure about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's that because of those insecurities, we try and project into the world this grandiose mm. character of ourselves. And that's what he's talking about is that that's inauthentic. And that needs to be looked at, inspected. Mm. 
I think so. Yep. It's that the more, you know, the more bravado and the more overly masculine and kind of intense and it usually means that somebody's compensating for something like those are the guy, like he talks about embracing your feminine side. If you are masculine and embracing your masculine side, if you're more feminine, like for men and women and the guys that are like so macho and like trying to really put on that front are usually the ones that are the most insecure that have like the problems yeah. of not being understood as kids. And they're trying to say like, I don't need to be that way anymore. Like that's not who I am. And they get so, it's just over the top. And that's when you have to kind of question what's really going on there. And yeah, it is interesting. It is. I mean, it's completely fascinating. I just finished maybe, the chapter. Come on. Sorry, I need to just jump on please, in there. Maybe please. that's maybe that's what's going on here is because I totally see that in certain people. And maybe it's the blind leading the blind here, or I'm preaching to the choir and that this podcast and Too everything we up. talk about. But <laughs> Too we mice are churning butter. <laughs> in a milk vat. Two mice <laughs> churning butter in a milk vat. That's gonna be the title of this episode. But <laughs> you and I question everything to the nth degree. It's why we love having these conversations about life and the universe and all of it. But I question when I'm doing something well and things are going well, I question that. And then I question that I'm questioning that things are going well. And so maybe that's why my experience is a little bit different than the other people who are able to project that grandiosity because I'm just so my default mode my inner critic is just the most relentless ruthless questioner of things so maybe that's where i'm not seeing eye to eye with this trope that everyone thinks they're better than they are okay so let me just so you you think that robert green is saying that people think they are just kings like you know they're just doing great they're killing it yet you feel it yourself that you're questioning everything and you're hard on yourself so you don't see how that is actually the human nature is that correct yes and it goes beyond robert green i'm just throwing him under the bus right. because it's fun it seems to it. be a common theme that is talked about a lot is that people think they're better at things than they are that they're more mm. capable more competent and i'm saying it has not been my experience with myself and also with others that they think that. Interesting. Yeah, I would. I think I would agree with you that people underneath, you know, underneath are really insecure and not as as confident as they appear to be. And even the ones that are even like you know, it's like how do they get to that point? They just got it all together. Everybody's struggling and everyone's going through something. So I agree. That people, you know, it's not as, it's not what it seems on the surface. And well, I think you just nailed it. I, I think you just nailed it in that underneath, we're all insecure. We all have no idea what we're doing. It's the external projection that I think I'm confusing the, the internal experience with the external projection of how people show up. So yeah. I think we're getting it right on both sides. Yeah. I think that we, we think that we have to be confident and like I was, I mean, it's just a good example of what's happening here. Like with this text of somebody I'm communicating with potential like employee and I just don't want to make the wrong move. And I'm afraid that like, I pretty much just said my situation, like what I was thinking to them. And now I'm afraid that I was like, it's just too, it sounded kind of desperate or it's too upfront, but it was, I'm like, my initial thought was, oh, I, I mean, I can't, this is just, this is this, this is the situation. Like you can't really fault me for it. But then thinking like, ah, uh, I just put myself in their position and seeing how it may have come off. And that's, that's when I started getting hard on myself. I'm like, yeah, you just fucked that up. But we're expected to put on these fronts and to look confident, to look like we know what we're doing, but we're all just kids who have gotten older and they're just trying to fucking figure it out this is a good segue into the meat of what i wanted to discuss today which is kind of men struggling but also 
just this new, this age that we're in that trying to, I mean, this is what the whole show is about, finding your life's purpose, your life's task. And so I just read the chapter of, of the law of, Laws of Human Nature by Robert Greene on finding your purpose and your calling. And pretty much his take on it can be concentrated into the following statement. Concentrate on maintaining a high sense of purpose and all the success will flow to you naturally. So he's all about you find your thing, you find your life's task, and that is really what relates to what you enjoyed as a kid, what you loved, your inner voice. It's finding your calling, the thing you were truly meant to do in life. And you might not be successful in the beginning, but you very likely won't be. It's going to take years of dedication and work to achieve mastery in that thing, and that's when the success comes to you naturally. And that just makes your life so much more fulfilling. But then I watched Scott Galloway on the Rich Roll podcast last night, and Scott Galloway is another one of our one of other another one of our favorite human beings. I will agree with that. I will agree uh, with that. Scotty G. Great. Love that guy. Yeah, Professor Professor Galloway. He's a legend. He's much more of the hard ass kind of cold turkey, cold cuts meat deli department. Uh, you know, hard look at life sort of guy that hits you with Says the hard how facts. it is. That's what I was trying to get to. Uh, hard facts, says how it is, but it's also got, you know, it's witty and dry humor. And it's just like good stuff about life. And he's really focused on how young men are struggling right now. Like that's kind of his purpose. And it's, it is beautiful gold and stuff. Like, so I'll, we'll get more into that stuff, but how he contrasts Robert Greene's philosophies. He says, find your talent, not your passion, and you follow that. So instead of trying to find your passion, like he says, you know, if you're trying to be an actor, if you're trying to be, you know, a, a DJ, like it is so rare to actually make it in that field. Like if you're, if you're not already freaking Brad Pitt, like you probably shouldn't put all your eggs in that basket. So for obvious reasons, that hits me at, hits me hard a little bit, strikes a chord. So I'm going for this writing thing. <laughs> um, so what he's saying is that you, fo you follow your talent. So he's like, if you are good with numbers and you somehow you like it a bit, like if you could get into being a tax lawyer or an accountant, like, and you, you could um, truly deal with it. And you could rise in the ranks. And if you could become the best, the top 10% in that, it's pretty much you're going to be making a living for the rest of your life and you're only going to get better. And if you can enjoy it, like that's a pretty solid life. Um, he's saying find the thing where there's a 90% employment rate, find the field and just get good at that. And then the better you get, the more success comes to you, the more mating options the prestige, like it all comes if you're competent and good at something. <laughs> Mates everywhere. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> like, like a chimpanzee in a, in a zoo. Um, so these are, these are the two, you know, perspectives on this thing. What do you follow? The, the talent, the money, essentially. Uh, that's what Professor G is trying to say. He's saying, get rich, get good at something. And then you've kind of, you get you start to like the thing instead of Robert Greene. He says another one of his quotes: "Money and success that last come from remaining original and not mindlessly following the path that others are following. If we make money our primary goal, we never truly cultivate our uniqueness, and eventually, someone younger and hungrier will supplant us." And I mean, I think just because I'm going for the writing thing, and I feel like there's no other option that I'm in Robert Greene's camp, but they don't have to be exclusive. You could definitely take from both. What are your thoughts? Yes. Let me get in, get on in here. Come on. In. It's really interesting because I really like Scott Galloway. Yet if I'd never heard of him and I was listening to how you described him, I would say, absolutely not. That guy's full of shit. It's really interesting because find your talent versus find your passion. I was good at numbers. I was good at finance. I was really good at Excel. You did it. You started out, you started on the Prof G path. Yeah. And I wanted to kill myself. Like I hated 
what I was doing. And if I would have stayed down that path because I was good at the thing, it would have led me to spending more time doing the thing that I was good at, but I hated. So that's super interesting because even if you raise, even if you rise up to partner level or owner of a firm where you're fundamentally doing an activity that you despise, I don't think there's any amount of clout, fame, success, money, potential mating opportunities that will <laughs> fill that hole in your soul. And I've never thought about it like that. And it is also, I'm, you know, we're gonna, we're kind of painting the picture right now that there's only two options. There's talent and there's passion, yeah, yeah. but there's always more options and it's always nuanced, but it makes the most sense to me to find the things that light you up and practice them so much that you develop the talent. Granted, I'm never going to be a concert pianist or play the violin at an incredibly high level, but I could get really, really good at things that I wasn't born naturally talented with. So that's what's coming up for me. It definitely seems like Robert Greene is winning this round between... First round goes to RG. Yeah. I like it. Dude, yeah, real dude. quickly, real Please. quickly. We're going to leave this in the episode. We won't edit it out. This should be something we do in the future. I think we need to start bringing in two different two views of people points. we look up to. Put them in the ring and talk, talk it out. See who wins. I love it. Prof G versus Robert Greene. I mean, those are... Those are my Mount Rushmore of legends to look up to. Yeah. I gotta write that down. Um, seriously, like brilliant minds, and yeah, it just shows you that there's no one way to look at it. Because like, right, it's got me in a bit of a turmoil last night. Like I was just cooking and listening to this podcast. I'm like, damn, like am I doing it all wrong? And because he's like, Professor Galloway is a professor at NYU marketing, and he's just, you know, he's finance guy insanely smart just came out with a new book the algebra of finance which i'm mm. gonna dive into because the algebra of success or of happiness his other book was terrific that's a great one um but yeah it's it is a minefield to understand like what tactic to do because i thought the exact same way i'm like okay so i do get into accounting i'm good at numbers i'm not particularly but say Sam, you, this is what you were doing. And you do, you know, you're, you're grinding away. You're in your twenties, you're making money, you're having fun. You're going, cause he, this is his life. Uh, Scott Galloway, he was in his twenties making bank at like, um, Lynch and Mitchell or whatever it's called. Mitchell Lynch, <laughs> Merrill Lynch, Merrill Lynch. <laughs> He's like, I all, love you so I much to... that you didn't know that. <laughs> It's like all I cared about was on Friday, all I cared about was who was I having brunch with? Like, who was I sleeping with? And it just, it got just that escalated more and more and more. And I mean, it sounds like it was like fun, but, but I mean, is he even taking his own advice? Like it got you're to a point for me him. Hate, you're making me hate I Scott know, Galloway so right now. If, <laughs> well, it's authentic. Like he, he had a total life switch like when he yeah got in like his 30s and 40s he realized like i'm there's gotten more to this and like he had kids and realized that that is the greatest joy that any human being could possibly have is finally when the time comes where you stop thinking about yourself and instead of brunch on friday you just think about your kid's soccer match coming up and that's like why he wrote the algebra of happiness and stuff was to figure out what the more is in life that we're looking for. And so I guess that he's saying, because what it sounds like is he's kind of gone against his own advice, but I think, and I also ran this through. I'm like, okay, think about who he's speaking to. He's speaking to all the young men who feel completely demoralized in their mom's basement and just having zero idea of like what to do who don't have a passion or anything that's calling to them. Like Robert Greene says, you should find. He's saying, start with trying to find something that you can make some money with, that you could actually get your life together with and take some responsibility and 
take it seriously. And that is when everything will start to come with you. You know, girls don't like you right now because you're living in your mom's basement. You have no job and no prospects, but and no confidence. But that comes from making money, from doing something that you feel competent in and for making a difference. And once you start to see that happening, you will build confidence and you will also like training, being physically fit is a huge part of this. He says, if you're around 30 years old, you should be able to walk into a room. And if shit got real, you should be able to eat everybody else in the room or run faster than anybody else. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. It's a good so, one. okay. This is, this is great. We're really breaking this down. I resonate with his fundamental concept of get good at something. If you don't know what it is you want to do with your life, pick something and start practicing it and get good at it because you can develop a passion for something as you develop competence. Competence. I was going to say confidence. This is very much what Cal Newport says about Cal Newport is a computer scientist, author, now has a podcast. He gave a TED talk around not following your passion, but following what you're good at. But for some reason, and I'm trying to articulate it, it resonated a lot more because it was more of choose one thing to get really good at. And once you get good at it, then you start to fall in love with it. And That's I understand Galloway saying as well, but he is in, again, in business I, terms. I love what you said. His advice is applicable to a lot of people, but for anyone who has an inkling of what they would like to do, of what lights them up, follow that. And then if you absolutely have no idea, then just choose something and get better at it. But it's a really slippery slope that he actually lived of pouring all of your worth and validation and focus into just making money and getting girls. And he went through the midlife crisis of realizing that mm -hmm. it's not just about that and that there are these other things. And it almost feels like it's a bit of a, there's this thing called a luxury belief, which is a belief you can hold because you have some sort of privilege or you've made it to a certain part of your life. So it sounds like he has that now that he's on the other side of the right. breakdown. Mm -hmm. But as someone who experienced the breakdown right away, like two years in, I was making the money. I was getting good at something. Girls didn't like me. Uh, <laughs> like I want people to not go through that and not have that shift when you're 45. I want people to have that shift when you're 25. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. It's a, I think this is primarily we're speaking to people in our generation where it's like, we still, which path do I choose? Do I go for a lucrative career off the bat and start just grinding? Or do I try to find the thing that lights me up inside and follow that? And it is really hard to know. Like even me right now, I'm still debating it, even though I have this thing that calls me more than anything other, which is like writing. And I want to be a, um, also a cool thing, which I've just realized is that like, we've talked about this. I don't merely want to be a content creator like that. Right. It's, it's a tough, but like it's people are burning out left and right right now. Like it's kind of blowing up like in a negative way, like people are getting super successful, but people are just content creators are, I mean, in a sense, that's what we are, but it's like, it's just so much pressure. Your entire life is always online and people are just, everybody's a critic of you. Um, it's just a lot. And I've kind of realized that like I, I've talked about this before, but I want to go deep into subjects. I want to write books and travel and like do it old school, but in a new school way of telling stories and using technology and stuff, but to do it in my way. Pretty much be the next Anthony Bourdain. That's not just like a influencer content creator, but like telling yeah. real stories and going deep. And it's kind of what I'm. That's what I'm doing. And realizing that if I take the Robert Greene approach, which I think at the end of the day I always will, if I follow that guiding light, it doesn't matter if I, you know, wade off the road a little bit here and there. If I always come back to that concept, if I want. I want to go deep. It's going to take a long time, but 
it's what actually makes me happy as opposed to trying to keep up with algorithms and posting every day. Like that's not my true purpose. I think I'm always going to do it, but I'm following depth and it's, it's hard. To, why I was bringing that up is that even me right now, where I'm trying to find like a new job and just move to Tokyo. And I'll tell you all about that later, later in this episode, but it's tough, man. Like I'm trying to figure out what job to pursue as my kind of day job, or if I'm really just trying to find, or even just create my own online business and like really kind of try to be a content creator and actually make money from that. Or do I find another day job like in Tokyo or even something like teaching English again, where I'm not, not very psyched about it, like having a schedule again and stuff. But if it allows me to pursue what I want to be doing on the side, is that the path as well? So as we say, we are dancing in the flames, not merely looking back from the other side of the fire. We do not have it figured out, but we are in the ring. We are on the dance floor and it's exciting. Before we transition to speaking about other stuff, I want to ask you, do you feel like you're in the talent bucket pursuing something that you're talented at or pursuing something that you're passionate about because I have a very strong answer that I can hold of you because I'm not you and I'm not with your inner critic, but you tell me where you think you're at. hundred <laughs> percent. Drum roll, please. <laughs> Passion. Yeah, I know, I know it is like, I can't do anything else, but tell my story of traveling through life and what I'm learning and I'll do it if I never make money from it. And that's how I know it's the path. I mean, I'm making decent, like I wouldn't say decent money, but definitely more than when I started, like from medium and stuff. It's pretty cool. And it's just, it makes me so like, I have to do it. And as long it's, I have so many quotes from this chapter. When I got to the chapter on this, I'm, I'm trying to not, look in advance at what the next chapter is about, like not the, because everyone's like, oh, sweet. It's gonna be like 30 pages of like this topic. When I got to the one about finding your calling, I was like, oh, buckle up. I just read the whole thing at once. Yeah. And have like pretty much like wrote down the entire thing because there's so many good quotes and stuff. But um, well, here's an applicable one, applicable. Um, when you follow its guidance, saying your inner voice is calling positive things tend to happen you have the inner strength to do what you must and not be swayed by other people who have their own agendas hearing this voice will connect you to your larger goals and help you avoid detours it will make you more strategic focused and adaptive once you hear it and understand your purpose there will no there will be no going back your course has been set and deviating from it will cause anxiety and pain that's how i feel it's like, I can't even imagine veering from this course that I've begun embarking upon of traveling and writing books, writing my story, just telling it. That's why, I mean, just like the quote, I, it gives me anxiety, just like not writing about my experiences, partly because I'm kind of trying to keep up with this machine that I've created. I think I'm getting better at that where I'm feeling less pressure, pressure that I have to do it, but more so that I want to. Um, but like, if I don't get the thought, the idea, the story down, like I get anxiety, like I, I have to tell it. And what's amazing and interesting and relates to my destiny is the back situation. I mean, like mm -hmm. on this path to healing and going through it, but I'm writing and telling that story more and more and realizing that I've been given this, you know, it's not the sound pretentious, cocky, given this gift of writing and I like feeling this calling because I can use these words to help people and myself get out of this pain and help understand it. And just seeing how these two things are weaving together is pretty astounding. Yes. I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> no, it does. And Obviously, you're a very passionate person, so it makes sense that you'd put yourself in the passion category. But the whole reason I asked the question is because 
when you describe the talent category, like that's where you're at. You're doing something that you are incredibly talented at. And if you weren't writing, I would reach through this Zoom screen and slap you in the <laughs> face because that is the kind of innate talent. I don't know if you were born with it or if you developed it along the way, but you have this talent to tell stories and to make the mundane beautiful. And so it's not either or, maybe it's a both and for this category. And I just want to make sure you you see that because Scott Galloway would say, look at you and he would say, you should be writing. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate that. I love you. And that's what, that's what makes it exciting is just to use a so Brendan in my back ability back breakthrough blueprint group to heal back pain. It's a lot of bees. Um, it's a lot of bees. It's called the BBB <laughs> back breakthrough blueprint. He says, if there is a next step, you are free. And that's just like pretty mind blowing. And so helpful because even in the dark times, ties are yesterday. I was pretty hurt. Like there's the next step. I know there's so much more. I, made a video about this to know that there's so much ahead is like, it can be either seen as daunting, intimidating. It could make you feel hopeless and it kind of paralyzes you. Or it could just be like, there's so much ahead that I can get better at that. I continue learning at that makes, that means I'm free because I could always get better. So that means this is not the end of the journey. And it excites me about writing because I know I got to use an example. This book that I'm working on now about my European journey a couple summers ago, um, had it edited twice with this editor that I used for my first book and sent it like the final proofread with another company that I used for the first one as well. But the editor's like, um, she kind of told the, the liaison, the person I was communicating with that the book needs much more work than just a, just a proofread. Like he should edit or he should suggest another copy edit. But they didn't know I already had a copy edited. And I kind of took it personally at first. I'm like, no, I already had a copy edited. What, is this, what need... does this mean for people who don't know? Sorry, yes. Even I'm somewhat unfamiliar with copy <laughs> editing versus proofreading. Right. So there should be a few stages of editing. So I did like 10 drafts of my own, just going through the book 10 times, doing all the editing I could, changing it a lot and stuff. But then I finally got to the point, it needs to be edited by a different set of eyes. And if you are an established writer, you have a publisher and stuff, you'll have an editor that you work with. For me, self-published my first book. And with this one, I'm going to try to get a publisher, but I want it to be like as good as it could possibly be even before that. So there should be a few rounds of editing with an editor. First one, copy editing, which they go through the style, the structure, the flow, just everything uh, of the book. They you know, do all the grammar and everything. So they go line by line, but they also give you suggestions. So he gave me like a whole document of his thoughts, how, where things could change, but also line by line editing. Go through that. The next one is line editing, where it's less structure, like the format ideas about the book and just more, you know, grammar and everything. The last one, proofreading should just be the last set of eyes before it's pretty much ready to publish. So mm. dot the T's, cross, cross the I's <laughs> sort of deal. And so, yeah, I thought I was ready for that stage, but she's like, this still needs, there's some stuff that just doesn't, um, it's not Chicago manual of style ready yet. Like just if it was truly about to be self-published because the proofreading company, it's pretty much editing for self-publishers. Mm. Um, you know, so, real, real quickly, you know what that makes me in, think please. of? It makes me think of when you were living in San Diego and you finished your first book. <laughs> I know what you're going to say. And I came over and we sat down and you're like, I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to read you the whole book and you're going to help me edit it. I want you to be like, my editor. <laughs> we got like three paragraphs in and you're like, this is <laughs> the worst idea <laughs> we've ever had. <laughs> oh, man. Well, this all ties in, Todd. We'd still be there. Everything. We would, we would still be there editing <laughs> that book. <laughs> Three years, the second five read. years later. So what do you think about, oh man, that is funny. 
Yeah, I thought you could be my editor just because I need like a second set of eyes. And that relates because to what Scott Galloway was saying and what you were saying because realizing that there's so much further I can go in writing. Like I could get so much better. There's just – it's one of those professions you can do for your entire life and just the, the deeper you get into it, just the – obviously you just understand more. You're able to – play with language and you just know the ins and outs but i so at first when i got that message from the this newer editor i took it personally i was like no i already had it copy edited like i just took it as a a comment on my ability and i'm like okay take a step back like you want this to be as good as it could be so that's that's what it'll be if you go with this uh, another copy edit and there's definitely things that i there's obviously things that i don't know about writing and editing and this is robert green 101 like you should be just thirsty to learn from somebody who knows more than you you are an apprentice like i haven't even started the true career yet this is just laying the groundwork i'm gonna be saying that until i'm 60 mm. but <laughs> haven't even started but just totally switched the, the perspective of there's so much to learn here and like getting excited about having it edited from this other person again. And of course, when I started like, she's super nice and she sent me like a, um, a, what would you call it? Sample. And it was, it was great stuff. Like it's not like fundamentally changing everything. It's just like little things here's here and there things that just need to be, finalized if it's actually going to be in book form and now like little tidbits that i just know about what a book should look like so it's already paying off so it's net positive but i can totally resonate with the feeling when you first get that feedback and you think it's done you realize it's not done and it hurts it kind of yeah chips away at the ego for sure exactly 100%. but then you realize it's only going to make it better it's going to be a better end product so you can acquiesce 100%. and why i brought all that up is because just like the whole talent thing is that seeing writing as a talent as well not like my talent but as a, a skill where it could be you can work at it it's something you can work at not just by writing my poems and like stories about life but by reading first of all and by trying different styles, by like truly trying to understand language and how to make it work and um, just being open, like me being open to this editor is obviously very important and just realizing that you do not have all the answers, but I want to be a student of life here. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir. Where are we going next? Because what, what do you think? Not... What, how about you? What is your... Would you put yourself in, you found something you're good at or you found your calling? Mm, great question. I think I made a hard left turn out of finance, even though I was good at it because I hated what I was doing and I followed what felt like more of a passion for coaching, for learning, for personal development. And because I've leaned into that, I've gotten much, much better at it. I think there is some spark of being good at conversation, being good at holding space and listening to people and having a strong presence. But just as you mentioned with writing being a skill that you can work on, you can increase it. So is everything I do. I mean, I've done hundreds of hours of training for coaching. I have hundreds of hours of coaching with clients. So it's something that I'm always working on, but it wasn't something that I was good at from the beginning. And it was mm. through following my passion that I found it. And now I have this thing that I can pour myself into and work on and hone the craft. And that's mm. where I take offense. That's not the right word, but that's where I have an issue with just do what you're good at because what you're mm -hmm. good at might lead you down a terrible path. You might spend your whole life doing something that you hate, but you're just doing it because you're good at it. And you keep moving up and getting better at it. And then people are so impressed with how good you are at this thing. But it's not you. That's what 
yeah, I didn't mention before when I was grappling with all this last night, as I was slaving away at making some broccoli, I'm like, okay, so you get into something you're good at. You're getting the acclaim, your prestige girls love you. Babies want to be your child. Dads want to kiss you. But it's like, this isn't, it's not what I want to do. It's not, you know, you're getting good at it and maybe it's like, it's paying the bills. And, you know, maybe this is one of the privileged perspectives, but if it's not what you enjoy, like what, is that the life you want to build upon? And obviously it can, that, that path can make you happy. You can get into something and there are definitely accountants and lawyers who love what they do. Like the, the divorce lawyer. But that's the thing. Um, that's the thing. That's the thing. We need to slow down on that point is that they love what they do. They are really good at it and they get really good at it, but they also love what they do or they develop mm -hmm. a love or right. a passion for it along the way. So it's almost like you got are saying two yeah, different start points, the two, but then, but then they can come together. Right. For sure. So the ideal situation there would be you find the thing you're good at. Maybe you don't love it at first, but you start getting better. It makes you money you know <laughs> it's all happening and you're starting to love it more and more you're like wow i really am enjoying this like it doesn't even feel like work anymore that's pretty ideal if you could find that i'd say probably go for it if it's like i'm good at this thing but ugh, i just it's soul crushing and i just have no interest but like you know it pays the bills that what robert green would say that's maybe easy to to uh to manage and kind of fake for a while but you get into your 40s your 50s and you get so bored and then you have a real crisis then because it's much harder to start over and that's when things you totally can but it's just much harder and you already have a life but he would say <laughs> i am robert green he would say uh at this point use the skills that you developed and slowly wane kind of divert the river into another river, but don't like make a, a abrupt and um, unpractical career change. You'd say like, I'm remembering a quote that he says, gently guide your skills that you've accumulated into something that more aligns with what you want to do. And like, if you already have the life, you have kids, you know, mortgage and such, you you got to get out if like if it's crushing you like i mean rich roll the guy whose podcast professor galloway was on he made he was a i mean he's a perfect example corporate lawyer making a lot of money um 40 years old he was unhealthy unhappy and just like broken and changed everything about his life very abruptly and turned in this podcaster this like health addict and I mean, he, he changed everything. Robert Greene would say, you know, kind of nudge your life in a different direction slowly but surely until it's more aligned with what you want to be doing. But if, if you're young and if you're looking for your answer, I think a great place to start is trying different things. You know, you got to analyze where you're good at. Another interesting quote he says, um, let's see here. Um, let me, do not let me, try to buy. Oh, oh. <laughs> you go. Do not try to. Yep. <laughs> Coming in. Do not try to bypass the work of discovering your calling, or imagine that it will simply come to you naturally. Although it may come to a few people early in life or in a lightning bolt moment, for most of us, it requires continual introspection and effort. Experimenting with the skills and options related to your personality and inclinations is not only the single most essential step in developing a high sense of purpose, it is perhaps the most important step in life in general. Knowing in a deep way who you are, your uniqueness will make it that much easier to avoid all of the other pitfalls of human nature. It takes work. It takes work. And what I'm sitting with is that they're all the right answer. They're all the yeah. right answer and they're all the wrong answer. And that you can't give broad stroke advice that's going to apply to everyone. 
and what I'm thinking about is if you don't know what you're passionate about, it's probably a good idea to go try a bunch of different things. Mm -hmm. It's probably a good idea to try and get good at one of those things. And you might get lucky along the way of building the skill that you fall in love with the thing and then the passion and the talent align and you can ride Mm -hmm. that ship. But you also better prepare yourself for getting good at something and realizing that it's not the thing you want to do for the rest of your life and be ready and willing and able to pull the ripcord and jump out the door before you get to the point where you're locked in and you feel like there's these golden handcuffs. Dude. Yes, 100%. Well said. Succinct. Beautiful. Man, this fires me up, buddy. To be sitting here talking about life, what we're going through, hopefully helping someone out there. Like, this is the shit matters. And I'm so grateful to be doing it with you. So grateful to be doing it with you. And two things pop into my mind, and then I'll pass it back to you and we can figure out how to wrap this up. But I've been thinking about this idea recently. When you're starting the path, when you're on the path, when you're at the top of the mountain, you never really know the impact you're having in other people's lives. You don't know who's listening to what you're saying. You don't know who's reading what you're writing. You don't know who's lurking, peeking in through a window at your life and taking something away from it. And it seems like the moments in which I'm the lowest and I'm trying to create something, I'm trying to write the article, I'm trying to get the newsletter out. It's those moments where I choose to continue and I get it done despite not wanting to that I get this encouragement from the universe. It happened last Sunday. I always try and get my newsletter done before the weekend. Didn't get it done. It's Sunday night. I'm in the office. It's like 7.30 p.m. Stayed up too late Saturday night. My brain feels like a baked potato. And I'm like, why am I here writing this newsletter? I could just not do it. I could skip this week. Be the first week in four years that I've missed, but no one would care. No one would notice. And I just did the thing. And not that many people respond to my newsletter typically, but the next morning I had like five people say, oh, this was great. I need this. Like, thanks so much. Best one yet. And I'm just laughing at how I almost gave up the night before and how I was like telling myself that no one cares, no one's listening. And that happens more often than not. It's the article that I think sucks that I publish that gets the best response. Or when I feel lowest, like I'm tired of creating content and no one really cares that I get the encouragement. Mm. Does that happen to you ever? No, no one ever responds to anything. <laughs> you were one of the people who responded to me, so thank you. Oh, I was. I needed that. It was that. a good one, bud. It was a good one. Um, yeah, dude. It's especially being, I've been thinking about being on my own a lot. It's like, I got to Tokyo, so this might as well be a good time to talk about this. I moved to Tokyo. Like I'm, I'm here in my Tokyo apartment and it is absolutely surreal. And I'm living in a little neighborhood called Nakano. Not a little neighborhood, but pretty big suburb. Um, and like I got here one week ago, last Thursday. It's Friday now. Went to, I went into town a few times, like into Tokyo. Um, but that pretty much just been in Nakano like for the whole week, just doing my thing, just like writing and looking for jobs and such. Just and I'm, wow, I'm just around. Like, like, what am I doing just in Nakano? Yeah, <laughs> putting around, going to the ward office. I'm like, what am I doing here? Like, what? Like, no, you know, I'm not with my friends. I'm just like in this little bubble of my own universe, my own making. I got my gym, like in my neighborhood now. It's like, what the hell am I doing here? And it's just crazy. That's like why it means so much more to be like, like talk to you as much as we do and my family and stuff. But it's, I get, you know, not that much response from the universe, but like there's this whole world inside of me that's this conflict of like, what are you doing here? And then I have surges of, this is like the coolest adventure. And I, could never imagine I could have never imagined it being like this but now I can't imagine it being any other way like I'm meant to be out in Tokyo like I'm in Tokyo like this is my favorite city in the world and I just live here now 
and have look around my epic apartment. I, I truly cannot believe it. Like, how did this happen? But I'm still in this little bubble. And it's hard to know, like you're saying, the impact you're having, if you're having any at all. It's hard to know if you're doing the right things without people to be bouncing ideas off of and just get that feedback. It's hard to know anything in life really with total finality but unless you're robert green unless you're robert green who he knows all he's the oracle you got i mean speaking of robert green it's the little inner voice that'll tell you like just keep going just keep going and what i was thinking about when you were saying you know no one would ever notice first newsletter in four years but you would know you would know. And that's what keeps me going at it. Like, you know, not to brag, but it's like I'm waking up at five thirty this whole week, like without a job, just because I'm like excited to get up and like start writing and to work on stuff. Like, I'm proud of that. I'm proud that I do that. And well now whoever's listening to this knows it, but like nobody knows that I'm getting up early to to work on my stuff or like even just to read, but I I know. And I guess those sometimes that inner voice can be your greatest critic as well. I mean, very often it's tough. And it's a lot, man. It's that's why, as we said in the beginning, young men are struggling and haven't really gotten to it, didn't really get into that very much, but obviously I think all young people are struggling, but men are having a, a tough go at it right now because there is this pressure and I'm feeling it too to do the Scott Galloway philosophy of like, we have, we are supposed to be making money. We're supposed to be successful and, you know, finding in, just in this age of social media and everything. It's like, we're comparing ourselves to literally everybody and we're all feeling this pressure that we have to keep up, that we have to be the hottest, the coolest, making the most money, driving the Benz, man, the Range Rover. And it's like, what is all this for? And it's hard. It's easy to say, like, what is all this for? It doesn't really matter. But I definitely feel the pressure that, like, I have to be doing more. I have to be keeping up. And if I'm not making money right now, like, am I, am I worthless, you know? And it's hard to make sense of it all. It is a crazy chaotic time we live in where there's so many, so much pressure from exterior forces that even though I feel so deeply, I want to follow the Robert green advice and like intrinsically, I feel that is the way there's still part of me that feels insecure that I'm not making a lot of money that feels like, um, not, giving my all it feels like I'm just kind of coasting and just gallivanting I'm out here just having fun and it's hard to know what to believe yeah most of what you said makes sense in the sense of I understand why you would question it or ask it Mm -hmm. The piece that didn't connect for me was that you're being lazy or not working hard because it seems like you're working incredibly hard at what you're doing. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. I mean, maybe this gets back to the, in the beginning, just like feeling like we are not doing as good as we should be or just always going to be the hardest on ourselves. Like maybe and this is something that I – definitely have this conflict about it's like because i feel like i am working really hard but just because it's i don't have a job right now like i'm looking for one even though i'm working hard but just because it's i'm not making money it feels like wrong mm -hmm. and that's like a cultural paradigm that is an interesting one and tough to tough to understand like money is the thing that makes just on the surface that is worth worth money is worth and if you're not making money you're just a 
a drain on the system. <laughs> Just a drain. But what's crazy, <laughs> what's crazy is that you'll never get good enough at the thing that you ultimately want to be making money from writing, podcasting, creating. The only path to get good enough to actually make money from that is to spend all this time not making money from it in the beginning. Hmm. Right. That's definitely true. And it makes me think of uh, James Smith, I think his name is, the YouTuber. He's like, if, well, it's kind of applies, but he says, if you're making, you know, if you're making this much money, if you're making this much money doing something you hate, imagine how good you'd be doing something you love, like how much money you'd make. Or, and it's, I'm kind of reversing that of like, well, I guess how much I like it without even making money. Think about how much you like it once you start making money. But also, that could change a lot of things. So you never know. Um, Real quickly. Pretty much, please. No, you, sorry, you go. I keep interrupting you. <laughs> no, no, no. I... Come on in. Come on in. What I've been thinking about, if anyone has examples of this, please point me in the direction. But (laughs) one of the biggest fears that we're grappling with, and I'm sure everyone can relate to this, is we have that fear of, we have that fear deep down that if we keep pursuing our passion and we keep trying different things and we keep trying to find what it is that lights us up, or we find one thing and we stick at it, that We'll spend our whole life, and let me just make this in terms of myself so I'm not projecting on everyone. (laughs) What if I spend my whole life being consistent, being disciplined, trying to build the skills so that I can do the thing I love and make money, and I get to the end of my life and never found that material success? And Mm. I honestly just don't know if that exists. I feel like there's one washed up person in the extended family or a friend of a friend that your parents tell you about to scare you to choose the safe, comfortable option. But if you want to become a YouTuber and make lots of money on YouTube, the reason why most people don't make it is because they stop. Like I would love to see the statistics and the data on people who put out a YouTube video every single week for their entire life. Like I think you would have to be successful. I think there would be no other way than success because you would learn so much and you'd find a niche. And I guess what came up by a pause is the only way to not be successful would be to not learn. Mm -hmm. So if you're just doing the same thing over and over and over again for years, it's not working. That makes sense. But most half rational people can learn from their mistakes. Iterate a little bit. Yeah. Does that make sense? What I'm, what I'm saying is that like this biggest fear, how can you fail? Yeah, no, I mean, completely relate to that. I think about it all the time. I'm like, okay, we're young now. It's and it's it's fun. It's it's much easier to say like, oh, it's gonna work out. It's gonna be great. Like, there's no way we're gonna fail. Something we always say. All this stuff. But if we're 35 and we're in the same place, it's much. You gotta take a good long look in the mirror and be like, is this gonna is this gonna work? And it's even scary now, but like I'm sure it gets scarier and scarier. But the only way for it to work is to not stop and to keep <laughs> to keep going. Same thing, but exactly, <laughs> it's, it's like, like this. It's, it's pretty much just you got to face fear in the face, <laughs> face fear in the face, and just fucking keep going. There's like, and the people who stop, let fear get the best of them, and that is the beautiful thing of life that we don't know what's gonna happen. And it makes me think of so many things. It makes me think of Charles Bukowski and Stephen Pressfield were both like late fifties when they first got published. Mm -hmm. There's so many stories of that. It's crazy. Sorry to interrupt, but like the people like we know Stephen Pressfield in his career, you know, as he's like a 60 year old man and like writing gates of fire and stuff. He had, yeah, 50, 50 years of life before that where he was just trying things and working on salmon boats and like Robert Greene too had like he was pretty much the same situation bunch of different like over 100 different jobs I think and until he was like in his 30s or 40s even when he got like the rights to write the laws of power and we just don't we see the success stories that 
of people and like how do they make it and Robert Green has given and Stephen Pressfield has given me, me so much. They're on my Mount Rushmore of writers. And all I know of them is this like tiny part of their life. And they couldn't have gone to that point without all of the experience, without the story to tell. And that took decades and decades of building. So dude, it's I mean, that's fucking exciting. It's like even if you're not a success, what seems like what seems like a success you have to keep going and that is your story that is your adventure and if it never pays off anyway man at least you tried which is a hell of a lot more than most but that's the thing and i'm going to keep coming back to it is that i don't think <laughs> yeah, yeah i don't possible. know if that exists right where you legitimately stuck with it you kept learning you kept iterating and have you don't achieve success. success it makes me think of I don't know where this came from. It was on a podcast I heard recently. Anvil. I think we talked about this the other night. Yeah. yeah this yeah. rock heavy metal band from the 80s never found the success that they wanted. And this guy was still performing to his friends in like a little town in Canada at like mm -hmm. 65. And he got discovered by a documentary filmmaker. They made a documentary about him and the band. And now he's touring the world. Like yeah. finally doing the dream. It's wild. And yeah. there's a very close, there's a very close version of this that is not what we're talking about that can lead to failure and not making it where you keep jumping from one thing to one thing to one thing and it's shiny mm -hmm. object syndrome. It's not, it's shiny object syndrome masquerading as you trying to find your passion. Right. I think there's a big difference there. So you can get to the end of your life and say, wow, I wish I would have chose one thing to focus on more but only if you were making the jump because it was always the grass is greener. If you're legitimately trying to figure out what lights you up and you spend your entire life searching for it, I think at the end you'll be content and happy that you at least tried, that you didn't give up. Mm. 100%. And yeah, this is, I mean, this is why I love Robert Greene, <laughs> this whole episode. But he says like, cause he's a big proponent, like he did himself, he had hundred, hundreds of jobs of trying a lot of things, but he says, like, they got, there's gotta be a framework. When you're young, you should have adventures. You should be, you know, traveling the world and like doing what you want to do, but in some sort of framework, somehow following your inclinations, trying to learn and trying to connect and weave this story together of different jobs and seeing, just learning from it. If you're jumping from, you know, totally random stuff that have nothing to do with one another just because you're bored and you just want to get to the next thing. Yeah. You're not going to really get good at anything and you're always just going to be kind of on the surface of something until it gets bored, boring and the good, the fruits of the labor truly come. And this is like the greatest wisdom and why it's very not fulfilling, but, um, uh, what is it called when it, it's, uh, eases your mind a bit like it's um anyways it's all about patience like casey nestat who brought up the the anvil story i think that's where we learned it from yes that's where it came from yeah he says like if you want to do the thing it's patience and that's what you don't learn it takes 10 years to be an overnight success at least um but people don't have the patience for it and 10 years of really hard work yeah at least 10 years like yeah. everything good comes from going deep and being patient for a long time it's gonna take a while and yeah i like that whole concept of exploring being open you know not closing the doors to new opportunities and stuff but having some sort of framework to work within and i'm in robert green's camp at the end of the day because he's all about like just listening to the inner voice and the inclinations of what did I love as a kid? And not everybody even knows what that is, like he was saying. But what did I just enjoy doing? When did I feel like there was parts of me that felt the most like like me, where I wasn't wearing a mask, where I could truly be myself, where I could, you know, I did something that was felt kind of easy, but for other people it seemed harder. Really got to pay attention. And from my own experience, I didn't 
like that's not that wasn't me i was not a writer when i was a kid by any means i, I didn't know what i wanted to do as a kid and if i think about what i loved as a kid it didn't help me either so i get 100%. what you're saying yeah like i did not you know was not an english guy or like was not on the newspaper or anything i studied journalism because i thought i wanted to be a broadcaster like i was going to be like an anchor and i hated journalism however this is why it's all kind of wild to me i didn't like broadcasting and i went into the news writing track just because i'm like i might as well like just be might as well just get into writing I had no idea that's what i truly wanted to do graduated despising everything about the news and about news writing and just like hated the whole concept and i started blogging just about you know i about finding my passion my path in life and i realized on a trip to berlin just like walking on a canal at dusk one night I'm like this is what i want to do this is like how can i make how can i bottle up this experience and like have it all the time when i'm learning about a new place i have this feel just this energy inside of me that's like a firefly <laughs> twinkling <laughs> like i just felt that that thing rising up and that is the moment i realized traveling is what i want to do and i started writing about traveling and then it all clicked like traveling and writing that is my jam so it took introspection it took journaling and like questioning what i wanted to do but then looking back the story weaves you know the stars align in retrospect the dots connect looking backwards and ladies and gentlemen i think it's safe to say that robert green wins this <laughs> round this bout you've done it this time rg yeah this is gonna be fun we'll get it on next time but i'll finish with this oh, please come in do you have anything there i want to say one more thing and then i'll let you bring us home mm -hmm. going back to the story of the person who is 65 still playing heavy metal still trying to have the dream come alive if he would have stopped at 64 it would have been a sad story but because he kept going it's a happy inspiring story and i think it only becomes a sad story if you give up if you quit mm. if you stop going toward the dream i have it right in front of me and i'll post it the only way you could lose is if you quit yes if you don't quit you haven't lost and that's just like that's that's the north star persistence patience and if you do the thing that journey will bring you so much meaning the journey of trying to achieve this thing and that is why i think we're here you know it's like Sorry, Professor Galloway, but you are slowly slipping down the the rungs of the ladder here. It's like we're not here just to make money and to be look for the next high. It's like I want to be here for a meaningful existence, and this is actually the perfect segue from the final quote by none other than Sad Guru. <laughs> remember Sad Guru? Oh, I is remember him. <laughs> I remember your Sad Guru face. Guy? I got, I'm getting back into him because I just need like some great joy and some mindfulness in my life. He says, Sadhguru is just this educator and this yogi. He's probably like 65, has this just sagacious, beautiful gray beard and mustache, this Indian man. He, he's the founder of this huge nonprofit organization that the Ishi and do the yoga and stuff. But he says, the only real wealth you can carry through life and death is profoundness of experience. That, yep. that is wealth. How deep did you go? Every day here is profound experience, whether I'm in pain with my back or whether it's pain free or whether I'm struggling, trying to wrap my head around what I'm supposed to be doing in life or whether I feel like I found it. Every day is meaningful because I know deep down that I have followed this calling and it is very far from always easy, but it's deep, profound experience. And that is wealth. That is like, I can't see any other more important reason for being here.
Beautiful. I think that's it. Thank you everyone for tuning in with us today. We appreciate you. We love you. If you're listening to this on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, maybe on YouTube, leave Mm. us a review. Please. Really appreciate it. Yes, we love you all. Hope to inspire you in any way we can as we continue stumbling forth the life of our dreams. 